Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Roberto Del Loro. I'm the director of the Bioethics Institute. And on behalf of faculty and staff at the Institute, I welcome all of you to our 2019 O'Malley Lecture, which is titled Radical Bioethics, Disability, Difference, and Desiderata. It is a great privilege for our university to have for an entire semester, Professor Mary Jo Iozio as the visiting O'Malley Chair at the Bioethics Institute and in the context of our master's program. She's currently teaching a graduate class which is actually dedicated to the topic of bioethics and disability. I would say that the lecture tonight represents the high point of her presence at the Institute. And I think we are very excited about what will come from this lecture. Um, I will introduce more formally Professor Iozio uh, shortly, but let me say a few things about the topic itself, because you might wonder disability, what does disability have to do with bioethics? Why are we talking about uh, disability in bioethics. So I'll, I'll offer my two cents without any pretense to anticipate anything that Professor Iozio will actually say. That the question of disability ought to concern the field of bioethics should not come as a surprise. Bioethics deals with questions that concern ultimately the ethics of life, especially those issues emerging in the fields of medicine and the life sciences. What is at stake in those questions is ultimately our human condition. And I would say our human condition in all its potential for flourishing, but also inescapably in all its, let's call it, vulnerability. So if we think about it, our human condition is indeed one of vulnerability. We are vulnerable beings. We are subject to illness, to suffering, to disability, and eventually to death. Uh, I hope this is not too gloomy for you. Now, the paradox is that although a universal dimension of human existence we have a tendency to bracket our vulnerability. And in so doing, we also push to the side the particular vulnerability of persons with disability. Our almost natural attitude, especially I have to say in the scientific worldview, goes in the opposite direction, that is, in the direction of striving to enhance our human condition, to overcome diseases, to devise new therapies, and to search for powerful remedies in the pursuit of ultimate happiness. So I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. For example, think how medicine pushes us to perfect our bodies through ever sophisticated forms of cosmetic surgery, and how the effort is driven by an expanding market of sellable images available for public consumption. Or think about medical research. Of course, there's nothing wrong with medical research, but medical research often with questionable public consensus and not without financial incentives seeks new avenues for exper experimentation on human beings with the engineering of genes, tissues, organs, etc. So unfortunately, such pursuits of perfection coexist with wider manifestations of collective vulnerability. The physically and intellectually disabled, the poor and socially marginalized, still haunt our dreams of perfection like a nightmare, awaking our own creativity to the crude reality of the vulnerability we will always have with us, indeed 
within us. And so the challenge of the topic tonight is clear, and I conclude. What if persons with disability were to be a powerful reminder of the fact that we become truly human when attending to their vulnerability, we also become able to accept more patiently our own. How would such a realization reorient our aspirations? How would it change our being in the world with others? How would it inspire our generosity? Well, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that Professor Iozio is a national and international authority on this topic, the topic of ethics and disability. She's a, an authority in many things, but certainly on this in particular. And so I get to introduce her a little bit more formally. She's a professor at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. She earned her doctorate in systematic theology with a focus on moral theology at Fordham University. And before coming to Boston College, she held teaching positions at Fordham, I'm sorry, Barry University. We, we are going back, right, from, so Barry University, Fordham, Providence College, and the University of Rhode Island. Her professional work, which is well known in uh, many professional societies, includes appointments on several editorial and publishing boards. More relevant to our own discussion tonight, she serves as inaugural member of the American Academy of Religion Committee on the Status of People with Disabilities in the Profession, and as co-chair of its Religion and Disability Studies Group. Professor Iozio is a very prolific scholar. She has published many books and many articles in national and international periodicals. She has been for many years the editor of the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics and just a little uh, flavor of uh, her scholarship uh, I would like for you to get from the titles of some of her books. Self-Determination and the Moral Act from 1995 Considering Religious Traditions in Bioethics, Christian and Jewish Voices, 2001. Calling for Justice Throughout the World, Catholic Women Theologians on the HIV AIDS Pandemic, in 2008. Sex and Gender, Christian Ethical Reflection, 2000 Reflections, 2017. And finally, two forthcoming book, book projects uh, directly dealing with issues of disability, Radical Dependence, a Theological Ethics in the Key of Disability, and Disability Ethics, Preferential Justice. Uh, when does she sleep? I, I don't know. So, um, our evening tonight will comprise Professor Yotzio's lecture, and it will then be followed by a Q&A portion. Uh, it will be chaired by Professor Nick Brown, who is on our faculty, at the Bioethics Institute, and is also the director of the minor in bioethics. I know many of his students are here, so I'm sure they will be very happy to see him on the stage. So please join me in welcoming Professor Mary Jo Yotzia. Thank you very much, Professor Del Oro. It's a unique privilege for me to be here. I'm grateful for the invitation and grateful for your attendance here this evening. I hope the presentation does not disappoint. And I hope that I'm able to work the PowerPoint in conjunction with the presentation. <laughs> so radical bioethics, disability, difference, and desiderata. Knowingly or not, disability is a global reality about which two you people register a thought concerning its prevalence. As a result of this failure to recognize, this failure of registering, this unrecognizability, too few people without immediate experience of or any regular encounter with persons with disability remain unconcerned 
with this largest and most diverse minority of people across the globe. By the World Health Organization estimates, at least 15% of the Earth's human population are people with disability. Moreover, the likelihood of able-bodied, able-minded persons joining this minority increases with age, if not by accident or by diagnosis of, for example, Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, depression, diabetes, heart disease, mental illness, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and so many other conditions. No geographic location on the planet is immune from this prevalence particularly in relation to the vicissitudes of contemporary life. For example, travel, trudgery, terrorism. Though both poverty and place of residence increase and exacerbate the vulnerability to being born with or acquiring a disability in one's lifetime, my focus on radical bioethics offers one response to a dearth of theoethical and bioethical reflection on a critical concern for this population and for the requirements of justice that have been largely ignored in the vein of care for the support and the development of basic human functioning capabilities that are available in the common good, the means of which commons would be distributed with a preferential safeguard for persons and, and communities of people with disability. The O'Malley Lecture in Bioethics has engaged many subjects, from the critical questions of the intersections between the healthcare sciences with religion and ethics, the status of embryos and maternal rights, euthanasia and assisted suicide, healthcare professionals' participation in torture, and neuroscience tinkering to build better brains, among, under, among other subjects. The ethics of critical medical and essential health care for people with disability has not been considered explicitly, except perhaps as an aside to the focus of research in these lectures. Nevertheless, a growing number of academics in the humanities and the social sciences are recognizing the need for bioethical, philosophical, and religio-theoethical reflection on the subject of disability and on the ways in which people with disability have been ignored and or grossly underestimated as participants in and rightful recipients of the common weal. The common weal being the common goods of health, education, recreation, employment, commerce, social and political affairs, and religious observance. What follows continues the work I have done on theological anthropology, exploring the diversity of creation and the radical dependence that characterizes all people, not singularly and not especially people with disability, but a dependence that characterizes all people from the most robust to the infirmed, similar to the vulnerability that Professor Del Oro mentioned in, in his opening remarks. Such dependence raises critical questions of procedure in theological ethics, in bioethics, and in healthcare more broadly. Among the obstacles that I frequently encounter in my work are the persistent attitudes, the persistent attitudes notably identified by the social constructions of disability that preclude many initiatives that would attend to both critical and basic healthcare for people with disability. Nevertheless, and even as some of you are not likely to have been exposed to the histories of the many tragic and rather appalling experiences that people with disability have endured, the good news is as important as the sad and scandalizingly brutal treatment that they have received at the hands of their caregivers, their communities, and medical professionals. Thus, as more people with disability participate today in many different settings where previously they had been excluded de rigueur, non-disabled people have become more accustomed to both casual and commercial interactions with them. My hope is to further the work of removing the obstacles to care and the inclusion of people with disability throughout the commons of human encounter. Why radical bioethics? <clears throat> the Oxford English Dictionary, my go-to, 
The Oxford English Dictionary offers three meanings of the term radical, each referring to the defining nature of someone or something as one, fundamental or basic, essential, quintessential, two, inherent or innate, intrinsic, structural, and three, comprehensive or constitutive, organic, root. I start with the notion of radical as root to agitate any complacence in you toward what we in the West have inherited as a hierarchy of being, at least since Linnaeus in the 18th century, if not well before, with the 6th century BCE, before the Common Era, pre-Socratic philosophers to the Aristotelian trajectories in the metaphysics of the 4th century before the Common Era. So with the anti-racist, feminist, and LGBTQ critiques, I hold a view towards socio-political, theological, excuse me, towards socio-political and, the, and a theological kind of disruption about the taxonomic hierarchy and the subsequently normative ways of thinking about ourselves as member of the human family hominid or hominidae genus Homo, and species Homo sapiens. I challenge determinations at the root of who counts as members of the human fold at fundamental, inherent, comprehensive levels of this hierarchy, and I challenge the agency that some members of the species have exercised in determining restrictively the agency of most others those classified as marginal to the social, political, and religious, let alone academic and professional elite. I am suggesting a radical root change in the way that people with disability are perceived by many among the non-disabled and the subsequent ways, subsequent ways in which they, people with disability, are disabled by the social, medical, philosophical, social, and theological constructions of non-normative being in the world. The idea of, of constructions that cohere with the now widely accepted rejections of and efforts to dismantle racial, ethnic, and gender biases is critical to the work of dismantling stereotypical assumptions about disability and about people with disability. Briefly, the social construction approach presents the contemporary critique of long held to be true determinations about individuals and groups of like individuals, such that all persons belonging to the class have uniform experiences of being a woman or black or indigenous or gay or disabled. Moreover, individuals and the groups to which they have been assigned are stigmatized for being women, non-Anglo, native, indigenous, queer, and or disabled. Thus, following the lead of people with disability and their co-agitators in the radical disability movement, my approach to disability has matured from a focus on individual problems experienced by individual persons with this or that particular impairment to the wider oppression and social barriers that have historically excluded and disabled people. For all its efforts to pr promote autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, bioethics is not immune to the inherited social constructions of disability alongside the inherited assumptions about people with disability and the various which, ways in which they, that is, people with disability, have been and continue to be calcified, categorized, and classified as mostly unfit to share space with the non-disabled. I repeat categorized and classified as mostly unfit to share the same space with the non-disabled. However, since none of us are immune from, immune from these inherited assumptions and their subsequent applications to real people, it is important to unpack the assumptions about disability for the dangers that lurk within them. Granted, none of us likes to think that we can be mistaken about the values inherit, inherent to this or that or other concepts like beauty, strength, and adaptability. Nevertheless, glaring examples of the misappropriation of personhood abound. For example, some of the handing down of religious practices from generation to generation, 
were con conducted under pen penalty of death if persons refused to convert, for example. And just as mistakenly, imperial conquests, for example, by the Portuguese, Spanish, British, French, Chinese, Ottomans, and the United States, denied the humanity of many indigenous peoples in Africa, the Americas, and Asia, and elsewhere. Let us not be fooled. Many people today suffer enslavement in the form of human traffic trafficking for exploited labor, organ harvesting, or reproductive services and sex. In ways similar to the contemporary enslavement of people who occupy places hidden from a decidedly prejudicial social history and from polite company, too few people register a thought about the similarly prejudicial, marginalizing, and oppressive experiences of people with disability. With exceptions, people with disability have not been treated well. Their treatment has been identified and outlined for us by social science academics, psychology and nursing professionals, and humanities scholars in a system of models that distinguish one manner of treatment with positive or negative effect from another manner of treatment. Contemporary studies offer an approach to this history through the models of disability developed by people with disability. These models are related closely to the ways in which the non-disabled and dominant have codified their perceptions of people with disability according to the social roles to which they, people with disability, were assigned. The most common models of disability are the religious moral model, where individuals with disability or their parents or communities are responsible for the disability as punishment from God for sin or sins committed. The medical model, which conceptualizes disability as deviance and lack within the individual, and therefore all medical interventions are geared toward bringing the individual as close to normalcy as possible. And the social construction model. So I'm offering you three models. There are more than three to look at, but I'm just limiting us to the three because there are just too many to, to play with in this short presentation. <clears throat> The social construction model of physical and attitu attitudinal barriers of exclusion, like stairs, and inaccessible educational or recreational opportunities. Parallel to these models are social roles to which people with disability have been assigned as being sick or subhuman, a menace to the po general population, the non-disabled population, to be pitied, a burden uh, to be a wholly innocent, taking on the burdens that the guilty um, carry, to be inspirational, inspirational, to be part of the, uh, the amusement attractions, and a blessing. Regardless of model or role, each of these assignments includes greater or lesser degrees of stigma. Stigma the defining mark of otherness that clears the way to marginalization and to greater or lesser degrees of oppression and violence. The models offer a shorthand reference to understanding the presumptive attitudinal barriers that people with disability and their companions encounter all too frequently, even to this day, as we're far too familiar um, for some of us. Stigma, by the way, is a recurring theme in a lot of the literature by uh, persons with disabilities, scholars with disabilities who are writing in, on their own behalf and for their sisters and brothers with disability um, for inclusion, for purposes of inclusion. Stigma has its roots uh, not just in a, a cruciform sense. Uh, Christ is crucified on the cross and, and he reveals the marks of, of the crucifixion as the stigmata. Right? He's stigmatized with the death that criminals suffer. The second next popular place that you see stigma has to do with the whipping marks that um, were, were uh, inflicted on the African Americans enslaved here in the United States. Um, and, and the marks were a permanent stigma, stigmatizing, identifying uh, Mark, excuse me, I'm repeating the word mark too much. Uh, but that's what it is. Stigma has those kinds of roots to it. 
As disability advocates remind us, it's important to remember here that throughout recorded history, all forms of inequality, injustice, and oppression have been sanctioned in one way or another on the basis of assumptions of biological inferiority of the other. Contemporary efforts to decry these injustices and to reject these assumptions are rare, and when present, they devolve all too easily into patronizing thanks and nods. For example, uh, we ask the question, why at almost the end of the second decade of the 21st century, we, uh, why are the basic and fundamental human rights of people with disabilities still ignored? Why are the basic fundamental human rights of persons of color in the United States continually ignored? As an example, as examples, parallel. As suggested above, those with power the power to make and shape societies have been grossly mistaken in their judgment about the inherent value and dignity belonging to people with disability and others who do not conform to the hegemonic norm. Those mistaken judgments are the basis of a history of maltreatment that people with disability have endured, a history that has been largely ignored and likely intentionally unrecorded. In effect, people with disability themselves and their stories of success and failure and of loves and losses have been silenced over the course of time. Could be up there. Maybe. <clears throat> However, the culture of silence is no longer acceptable. The truth to be told is that newborns, infants, children, and adults have been neglected, abused, and exterminated on account of the presence of disability in their lives. With 15% to potentially 25% of people worldwide having one or more disability today, that's up to 1.75 billion of the 7.6 billion people inhabiting this planet. All right, so with 15 to potentially 25% of the population, it is undeniable that people with disability have been among the members of the human economy from antiquity to the present. This is nothing new. Combining the models of disability, the medical, moral, and social models, to parallel social roles of menace, burden, clown, individuals were identified taxonomically as other. This othering of people with disability has resulted in their <coughs> oppression as a class that Given the lessons, contemporary retrievals of the historical experiences of many members of minority populations, the treatment of people with disability similarly can no longer be tolerated. To the extent that those who have power, power and authority record history, resolutions concerning people with disability resulted in their marginalization on account of the causes those powers presumed at fault. Among the causes attributed to, to disabling conditions are defined punishment for some sin, either one's own or one's parents, or a show of divine power consorting with evil. The reason why something bad has happened to you is because you're playing with the devil. An imbalance of humor or, or uh, maternal stress during pregnancy, blame it on the woman, bestiality, menstruation, astrology. These are the things that were given as causes for why disability happens. Each of these causes encouraged perceptions that people with disability were more animal or otherworldly than human, that they could tolerate environmental extremes and malnutrition, and that they were dangerous to the societies in which they lived. These are conclusions that gave license to harm them with impunity by taming, sequestering, and worse. Uh, we know there was widespread sterilization um, up through the 1960s uh, here in the United States and in Western Europe. Scandalously, many individuals with disabilities who are feared and or loathed by the non-disabled would have been exposed at or near birth or otherwise ostracized once the presence of disability became known. They'd either be exposed at birth or if in their formative years a disability was um, expressed, they would be kicked out of the family. Infanticide by exposure was widespread, and in some state-sponsored state cultic system, the practice was mandatory. Mandatory. 
Some early Greek medical texts included information about recognizing defects at birth in the first months and early years so as to determine a child that is not worth raising. Aristotle, too, reminded, uh, recommended laws to prevent the rearing of deformed children and to deny deaf children, particularly boys, because those are the only ones who are allowed to, go to school in the community. Uh, they would burden the progress of the non-disabled boys of the community. In Greco-Roman antiquity, it would not have been uncommon for newborn girls or a newborn with observable disability to be abandoned or left in a crude cradle at the crossroads or near a market, a gymnasium, or a temple with some possibility of being taken up by and likely enslaved or tossed into the river by their patriarchs. Equally troubling and perhaps more horrifying, some children with disability were mutilated by their parents or their overseers or other wardens who depended on income from begging for their household maintenance and figuring if they further maimed their child with disability, it would increase the pity value that could be assigned on that child um, and thereby increase the almsgiving to their cause. This is pretty scandalizing. Among other curiosities, the Roman gladiator games included the spectacle of fights between little people, the deaf, and other people with varying disability that exhibited individuals with disability in courts of power as a sign of blessing of entertainment or pity to extend telethon-like charity. The early medieval period, there's a pattern here, huh? <laughs> Keeps repeating itself. The early medieval period made way for the custom of caring for the sick, those with disability, and the poor. Outside of the support of their natal homes, people with disability were reduced often to poverty, not so much different today, and they resorted to begging as a principal means of income, they as, as their own agents. <clears throat> Wanting to follow the example of Jesus, who attended to those who were marginalized for this or that stigma, Christians began to extend compassion on the less fortunate, i.e. the disabled. By the height of the Middle Ages in Europe, a period of organized beggary led to guilds open to people with disability and in which leaders emerged and rules and languages were developed by the guild members. The guilds, the guilds represent a welcome initiative by today's standards. Yet this same period saw the institution of idiot cages. These are real things that kept people with disability confined while the cage protected those behind the bars, excuse me, those beyond the bars, not inside. And where cages were insufficient or when the masses tired of this or that caged group, the ship of fools provided another form of distance to keep people with disability apart from the main and exploited as members of a traveling carnival horror freak show, sideshow for port residents and visitors alike. The origin of the word, ship of fools, or the phrase ship of fools. And then came the development of institutions. This is, this is our palpable history. Founded as a result of a system of hostels for pilgrims on their way to a holy site for both blessings and cures, hospitals for the sick and, in, and incurable became asylums for the insane and invalid. With the advent of the Enlightenment project to reject the old and the quaint in favor of a rational order, New scientific ways of conceiving the individual and society and the common good brought to the fore utopian concerns of a more perfect communion, over, overtly including an underlying concern for the dangers lurking in any mere per presence of people with disability. The isolation of institutions provided safety for the non-disabled as well as it gave rise to better or worse care for those who were institutions institutionalized, where even up to and including the 20th century, as a captive population, they, people with disability, could be studied objectively. With concentrated access to people with a diverse array of disabilities, doctors and scientists began to investigate the causes of disabilities using the then newly advanced medical and empirical methodologies. Some of this early science fueled the later 19th and early to mid 20th centuries eugenics movements through the subsequent sterilization of people with disability and other suspicious folk, i.e. Uh, mostly gay and lesbian. 
Consider the scientific proofs of a biological basis for the categories of race and the subsequent discrimination against non-white peoples, especially peoples of African descent, that labeled many deviant. Have you seen the statistics of the numbers of African American men on death row in the United States? Or incarcerated at any level here? It's obscene. People from Mediterranean countries and Asia were considered to be of questionable genetic stock, in case you were wondering, and likely to increase the number of feeble-minded and criminals that would become wards of the state, right? It's all about the money. It would be better to prevent them from reproducing altogether. Sterilization. As long as people were institutionalized and isolated from general human com commerce, they were, and those who remain institutional uh, institutionalized are vulnerable to abuse, exploitation, and other dehumanizing injustices. Now the confluence of, so of social progress, science, and rational self-interest led to the systematic individualization and medicalization of all persons, those deemed normal and those deemed othered, as subjects, that is the normalized, and as objects, the aberrant, 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 abnormal, and disabled. This systematic program led to a widespread ideology of disdain for, dis-ease with, and distrust of any who did not, or do not still, conform to the hegemonically putative normative ideal. Oh, I'm sorry, ideal modern man. Right, isn't that a, this is a great mouthful hegemonically putative, normative, ideal, modern man. Take that one home. By the 20th century, eugenic initiatives were set in Europe and the United States with sterilization programs and final solutions and a murderous holocaust of untold, unnumbered, unnumbered, and unaccounted hundreds of thousands of people with disability. Scandalously still, eugenics and euthanasia by a different name continue apace with neonates, children, adolescents, and adults in their prime and elderly with disability as today's principal populations that are vulnerable to medical, social, scientific control. While eugenics may not be institutionalized, it ho holds ideological power and is practiced widely in re reproductive medicine and the selective abort abortion of fetuses. Similarly, euthanasia remains a threat as the contemporary equivalent of exposure by withholding life support from a person, neonate or adult, who could thrive if given the chance, not with heroic or extraordinary intervention, but with the radical bioethics notion of ordinary care. Disability is a multi-dimensional concept which should be understood in terms of a continuum. What number am I here? We'll keep it there. <clears throat> this continuum is true for all people once born and throughout the days of our life. Even so, a disability continuum may have more dramatic punctuations than the common wheel. As such, bioethics attention to the multifaceted experience of people with disability has the potential to integrate disability experiences in both critical interventionist care for things like substance abuse or cancers, as well as the more mundane and presumably easier access to routine health checks and preventive holistic services, like nutritional support, exercise programs, education and social interaction in arts and leisure and recreation. Bioethics will need to approach the subject with humility since any attempts to categorize disability in generic terms will fail, as I'm failing here, trust me. Um, especially since the human organism is itself complex, nevertheless the phenomena of disability, phenomena plural, of disability are expressed in the literature as physical impairments, sensory, sensory impairments, blind and deaf for example, cognitive and or developmental disabilities, mental health and chronic illness. I don't think I'm up there yet. While disability has been a feature of human life throughout the millennia, the contemporary climate suggests that the phenomena is rare, or if not rare, better to be left unspoken and closeted. The history above belies the rarity of disability, 
15% of the population. No other population on the planet garners that many. Um, ah, do we have it right there? China. China has 1.42 billion. The number of persons with disability is 1.7 billion. Uh, India has 1.37 billion. This, these are numbers one and two. And number, United States come in number three at a mere 3.3 million. All right, so persons with disability are the largest population, co coherent population on the planet. The history above belies the rarity of disability and the suggestion that a culture of glamour or power or the accumulation of wealth is sufficient to disguise the presence, the challenges, the joys, the hopes and sorrows, as well as the contributions of persons with disability in ways grand and small yesterday and today. The initiatives of the United Nations in its Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, 2006, are key for advancing the cause of recognition and self-determination for people with disability. Although the United States has signed it, it has not ratified the convention and remains, therefore, not bound by its statutes. Nevertheless, Article, Article 4 notes that states parties undertake to ensure and promote the full realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for all persons with disabilities without discrimination of any kind on the basis of their disability. The US has not ratified this. So they're not bound. We are not bound. It's problematic. The full realization of all human rights requires that persons with disabilities, like the non-disabled, have access to the basic goods of safe housing potable water, nutritious food, education, family relations and friendships, health care, employment, recreation, public services, and religious or other spiritual practice. These are the basic goods, the common goods for humankind. Additionally, Article 10 of the Convention reaffirms that every human being has the inherent right to life, and states' parties shall take all necessary measures to ensure its effective enjoyment by persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. So if 15% of your population, if 15% if of the population of the people in this room do not count up to 50, count up, I don't know how many people are here, but if we do not have a 15% quorum of people with disabilities, this is not an inclusive space. We are denying, unknowingly, we are denying the exclusion, excuse me, denying the inclusion, denying the access to people with disabilities of many kind. At 15 to potentially 25%, in fact, the United States registers in at 23% of its population with disability. So we could up that number to 23 and there's more egg on our faces. The World Health Organization published the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health in 2007. We're still not there. Um, this is always off. <coughs> um, yeah, there it is. Okay, so I kept it together. Um, <coughs> thank you. Um, the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health was published in 2001 and 2007. The, um, the children and youth version was published as the framework for measuring health and disability at both individual and population levels. In these texts and in the related 2011 World Report on Disability, the World Health Organization, who from now on, who conceptualizes a person's level of functioning as a dynamic interaction between her or his health alongside environmental and personal factors with a comprehensive basis for the definition and measurement of health and disability. The idea of functioning as a measurement was inspired by the work of economist Amartya Sen and philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who de developed the capabilities approach to discern an individual's functional development and attainment of health. In brief, the capabilities approach holds that all human beings have a virtual obligation to develop the abilities inherent to each, albeit in variable and disproportionate, disproportionate measure across the capabilities spectrum. We have an obligation to develop abilities that lead, if given the opportunity, to flourishing and a good human life as a positive natural life, natural right, and the province of human initiative. Nussbaum articulates these capabilities as the basic human rights to acquire functional development to live. 
to have a body, to, uh, to have bodily health and integrity, bodily integrity, to enjoy and the development of your senses, to express imagination and thought, to have and reveal emotions, to develop a practical reason that's peculiar to each. Right? We all have our little ways of thinking about things. To be able to affiliate with others, um, to have concern for other species. We know the dangers that our planet is currently in and all those who inhabit this place. Um, opportunities to play and control over your immediate environment. As used in the International Classification of Functioning, the capabilities approach offers a holistic metric to determinations of health and well-being based on an individual's development of abilities alongside personal, local, regional, national, and global infrastructures the infrastructures of educational, occupational, medical, recreational, and social opportunities. These things are necessary to support the development of each of our basic human functioning capabilities, not just people with disability. Each of us needs education, occupations, um, health care, time to play, and time to be with family and friends. In matter of fact straightforwardness, the WHO admits disability is part of the human condition. The WHO argues further, the international classification of functioning is named as it is because of its stress is on health and functioning rather than on disability. I'm sorry, I'm quoting this. Previously, disability began where health ended. Once you were disabled, you were in a separate category. We, the WHO, want to get away from this kind of thinking. We want to make the ICF a tool for measuring functioning in society, no matter what the reason for one's impairments. So it becomes a much more versatile tool with a much broader er area of use than a traditional classification of health and disability. It's functioning. Have you met your functional uh, capability? Each of our functioning capabilities will vary from person to person to person to person having disability well, not to interfere with the development of one's functioning capability. It's a continuum. I quote again, this is a radical shift. The who uses these terms. This is a radical shift from emphasizing people's disabilities. We now focus on their level of functioning and health. This is a radical shift. The, internet, the ICF distinguishes between body functions, body structures, activities and participation, and environmental supports or lack thereof. To use the language of more common parlance, the functions reflect the purpose of mental, sensory, voice, organ, metabolic, reproductive, neuromuscular, skeletal, and skin systems. The structures refer to the engagement of procedures or steps involved with voluntary and involuntary movement. Activities and participation consider the degrees to which individuals engage both functions and structures from cognition, affect, and locomotion to self, family, community, social, and civic care. Environmental factors include considerations of the presence or absence of support for integral human developing, development and flourishing. Thus, disabilities fall into one or multiple classifications. In a similar vein, Many people have co-occurring symptomatic dysfunctions, disabilities, and health complications with their primary mental, sensory, voice, organic, or organic, metabolic, muscular, skeletal disability. Under the Americans with Disability Act, the categories that qualify a person for accommodations of individualized support or relief are expressed in physical or mental impairments that interfere with major life activities. These being affective disorders, autism, blindness, cognitive disability, deafness, emotional development delay. These are the, the categories that fall under the ADA and for which a person can apply for um, ser services um, as well as appeal in cases of discrimination. Um, these initiatives and legal precedents cohere with a baseline understanding of human capability that takes the contexts and particularities in which individuals and communities live as key to unlocking everyone's basic human function functioning capabilities. Nevertheless, people with disability are characterized by low human and social capital. The thinking of otherness persists. 
Thus, to consider health on the basis of functional capabilities development is both promising and dangerous for people with disability. It's promising since focus is placed on the determinations of an individual's developmental capabilities and efforts and collaborations with social systems to develop those capabilities. Got to have the social systems. We have to have those networks. Uh, not a one of us got to where we are today without myriad social systems at work on our behalf. It's dangerous, right, this development is dangerous since location will determine access to those necessary support systems. As a cause and consequence of disability, poverty remains the single most difficult obstacle to overcome and poverty is directly related to an individual's ability to exercise his or her basic fun functioning capabilities and to thrive. Difference. This is uh, part three, I guess. Introduction, part one, part two. Um, all right, introduction would be part one. Then part one, um, part two and three is difference. Um, the thing I propose is radical here is not in the sense of protocol be damned in reference to bioethics difference, but in the more mundane and, and more nuanced frame of the ways in which a fun fundamental set of attitudes and actions can take hold in matters pertaining to bioethics in general, to the subject of disability, and more importantly, toward persons with disability in particular. The radical nature of this inquiry harkens to the origins of the discipline of bioethics that was begun with the Hastings Center in New York in 1969, the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University in 1971, and to Van Rensselaer Potter, the oncologist who coined the term in 1970, at least in its English usage. The oncologist, uh, onc yes. Excuse me. Potter was particularly interested in the intersections and shared information of findings between the biological sciences and the humanities so as to ensure the benefits of research would yield results that attend to real persons and the e ecosystems that support human life. Global in, spoke, in, excuse me, uh, global in scope, transdisciplinary in method, and most importantly, compelled by a commitment to action that demanded personal engagement with social issues. This is what bioethics, as, uh, as Potter presented it, ought to be. This inquiry is radical in its adherence to the foundations of the discipline per Potter and our early colleagues at the Hastings Center and the Kennedy Institute, many if not most of whom were raised, excuse me, who, who were trained, they might have been raised as well, as undergraduate students in philosophical and or theological disciplines, and for whom the science of med sciences of medical care and interventions were perforce designed for human health and the social good. That's a humanities approach. Uh, bioethics is a humanities that dabbles in science, medical sciences. Uh, <laughs> further, my project invites you, uh, oh, uh, 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 my project invites you to adopt this interdisciplinary approach as a radical bioethics of dependence on the whole sphere of human commerce with dependence normative thereby for all persons inclusive, inclusive of persons with disability across the millennia. Difference will be key to appreciating the diversity of persons and the perhaps even greater diversity of experiences among people with disability as equal to those among the general population. Experiences equal between persons with disability and the non-disabled. In order to ensure a comprehensive view, the insights of sociological critiques, which approach bioethics from particularity and context, offer a compelling argument that attends to lived experience, institutional culture, and structural injustice as the starting places to uncover the realities that honor persons with disability and their experiences. These approaches recognize that determinations of functioning capabilities depend upon considerations of interpersonal relations, institutional structures, and the overall social world wherein the subjects of care are situated in real time and place. Moreover, we cannot reduce the complexity of disability to either a biological problem, a psychological problem, or a social problem. All the factors of an individual's life must be considered and interventions of medical and re rehabilitation kinds assistive devices, psychological support, barrier removal, and welfare 
benefits, legal protections, and cultural change. Right, so the factors that need to be measured must be engaged at different levels for the benefit of the individual in need of care. There is no one protocol that fits all persons adequately. As many in the field of disability studies argue forcefully, disability may present as a health concern, but it is more an issue of social and economic concern. As noted above, across the world, people with disability lack access to basic health and rehabilitative services, as well as a lack of social support in the development of their basic human functioning capabilities. They face barriers and, and prejudice or poor, poorer quality of health care. This subpar access to care means their health outcomes are worse, not as a result of their underlying impairments, but because of failures to access, access the failures of access to general care. But what is difference at root? Um, diatoms, the image in the um, logo is an image of a diverse set of single-celled creatures that are the most diverse set of single-named things on the planet. There's billions and billions of them, more, more than the 7.6 billion people on the planet, right? It's like hundreds of billions of these things. All, all different than another. Um, they produce most of the oxygen that we depend upon. Um, difference is the condition of being or relation of distinction or diversity. There's diversity writ large. Here is diversity writ as large in the human community. To the extent that we have an equal percentage of persons from all of the minority groups that are uh, named in the United States, that is what diversity looks like. Okay. <clears throat> An older Latin connotation of difference points to diversity and is suggestive of variety, a point of dissimilar dissimilarity, but similar enough as to be recognizable as this or that thing or person. <laughs> I have argued that diversity is the distinguishing feature of all creation, human beings included. Um, not this way, though. As, and, I, and I have argued that diversity is the signature of God's handiwork throughout the known world and beyond. I recognize this diversity as God's own calling card and the way that God, in the Christian tradition, reveals God's self to us in relation with ourselves and with others. In Christian terms, God is conceptualized through a medium of difference or diversity as a trinity of divine persons, different and related. God as Father and Creator, God as Son and Incarnate Word, Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Christ of faith, and God as Holy Spirit, the transcendent love between the Godhead and the world. The Trinity is God in say, God in God's self for God, and God ad extra outside of God's self for us. The mystery of God is revealed in Christ and the Spirit as the mystery of love, the mystery of persons in communion who embrace death, sin, and all forms of alienation, that is, difference for the sake of life. Again, in Christian terms, the only way for us to know God is through God's own self-disclosure as the divine being in relation with God's self and with others, and thus, in anthropological terms, as being created in God's own image. We human beings are known only in relation to God and to one another. Our self-knowledge is dependent on the diversity of persons and other beings and things in the world. I cannot know myself unless I have you to see as another member of the human community, diverse, different, in radical ways and, and not so radical ways as I am. So I propose that we take difference or diversity as the key to our being in the world and into relationality thereby. While we may hesitate to consider disability as the synchronon tradition condition of humankind, it behooves us to recognize diversity and the dependence that attends to being and to all of our relationships of intimate and distant or per impersonal kinds. This dependence on the other unfolds in both deliberate and indeliberate ways. However, our task is to become ever more mindful of the others among us and to recognize the webs of connection in place 
or of rejection or disdain or fear. The radical dependence of being in the world belies autonomy and the self-made man. Thus, when we turn to disability identity with a posture of humility, we may soon discover the magnificent diversity in the ways persons become themselves and may soon find them beautiful. We may soon find them beautiful. Consider the tendency of delight many of us experience at the sight of a majestic mountainscape, a field of wild, fla wild flowers, a herd of buffalo, a night sky filled with stars or the songs of wild birds. We marvel at nature's diversity, but we may be stingy in recognizing diversity in humankind. There's no maybes about it, we're very stingy. In the world of dualistic segregation, superficially identifiable differences have been used to categorize and invariably establish hierarchies that rank the individuals and communities on the basis of their conformity to the norm. In the case of human norms, the dualisms of male, female, spirit, body, white, non-white, heterosexual, homosexual, and non-disabled, disabled, have designated the de facto, the second part of each pair as a defective version of the first. These designations subsequently led to the oppression or patronization of the second by the first. However, when diversity, inclusive of people with disability, is presumed as normative, these dualisms lose their power to elevate one expression of diversity, however narrow or large, over the diversity of other expressions. When diversity is normative, dualisms no longer make sense and an anthropology of inclusion can emerge in their place. I have five minutes. I'm gonna read faster. I have long avoided the question of desire in reference to interrogating my own life and its wondrously circuitous and amazing turns except to ponder the opportunities given alongside the choices made that brought me to this moment in time and to give thanks. I've led a charmed life, not without roadblocks here and there, but a charmed life nonetheless. For an even more conscious period of time, I've avoided the question of desire in reference to the lives of people with disability. I like to think that this avoidance is rooted in a posture of humility, but it's not true. Um, <clears throat> I am drawn now into the subject in recognition of the sad history of medical and social treatment that people with disability have experienced across the millennia from exposure to bullying, abuse, and murder, and to conversion conversations that many academic and policy makers have regarding the spoken and unspoken assumptions that they would be better off dead. I'm also drawn into the subject of desiderata by genuine calls initiated by some persons with disability and their family members, friends, and caregivers for interventions that promise to relieve some of the conditions, especially physical pain and the internalized suffering of rejection that compromise human flourishing. Disability in everyday thought is associated with failure, dependency, and not with being able to do things. But an anecdotal testimony reveals that for many people with disability, life is surprisingly good. More low, moreover, when asked, people with lifelong disabilities say, we don't want to be cured. Despite the best of intentions of family members and caregivers, like the non-disabled, persons with disability are themselves the principal subjects of their own lives, and they are thereby entitled to the exercise of autonomy. I am presuming a degree of cognitive and communicative autonomy that may be absent on account of age or developmental disability, but their desires were rarely taken into account across the ages of paternalism, such that past discussions in the medical arena on life with disability were often limited to the questions of to treat or not to treat and to let die. Today, with increasing disability rights adv advocacy and given the voices of people with disability, on the subject of cure, questions of intervention point more directly, directly toward facilitating life with disability through barrier removal alongside relief for sickness when autoimmune responses or influenza or cancer or diabetes present. Thus, not unlike preferred choices when it comes to the dinner menu, decisions regarding this or that intervention should be in the hands of the person being asked. As I return then to desiderata, a minimum desire among the community or people with disability is to recognize their agency. Granted, the spectrum of conditions that qualified as disabling are themselves diverse and often overlapping, 
both identity and agency di diversities will emerge between physical, cognitive, and developmental disabilities, but social stigma, the historically definitive construction of people with disability as inferior to the main and as such other, remains a common experience across the spectra. The deconstruction of stigmatizing otherness remains the principal desiderata of my work. From the recognition of the tangible desires voiced by people with disability, um, desires include minimally the removal of barriers, both physical and attitudinal, um, to wholesale inclusion instead of wholesale exclusion throughout the many avenues of social commerce. Uh, oppression remains the single most problematic of personal barriers to overcome. Two, reasonable accommodations to facilitate participation, accessible communication, formats like sign language, PowerPoints, not very good ones, but. Three, an overall slower, <laughs> this is funny, pace in language and in movement from place to place and for task to task. Really, what's the rush? For attention to equitable access, and there she goes again, uh, and critical health care, education, employment, perhaps most of all, friendship and other personal relationships beyond kith and kin in educational, social, commercial, employment, political, recreational, and religious arenas. What else is to be desired? Um, there are many disabilities that are preventable. This is not to say that persons who are, are born with disability uh, are, are not fully part of the human community. They are. Uh, but there are preventable disabilities, like, you know, although I used to ride a motorcycle, I no longer do. Motorcycles are very dangerous things and result in a number of disabilities that could be avoided otherwise. Um, driving too fast, guns, um, construction mishaps, you know, disabilities happen, okay, that are preventable. Uh, Concluding thoughts. I started this work with an invitation to consider today's more than one billion people with disability, almost two billion people with disability, as one of the most diverse populations of people worldwide. This population is a mass of people relegated to the margins of the larger social groupings to which they belong. In a time when gender, race, and bioecological bio diversity are championed and barriers to inclusion dismantled, dismantled the margins of human commerce to which many, if not most, people with disability are consigned are no longer tolerable. Truth be told, medical and healthcare professionals have approached care concerning persons with disability with a jaded view and a jaded past regarding their worth as marginal at best or their status as less than deserving of either routine or critical care. In response, I suggest radical bioethics that one, a radical bioethics that invites healthcare and bioethics professionals to recognize that a patient with disability is a patient first, points to a lack of attention on the part of these professionals in the discipline to be aware of the similarities and differences that disability presents in deliberations of treatment protocols, and three, as the WHO admits, from emphasizing people's disabilities, we have made a radical shift to functioning and health. Thus, following the lead of members of communities of disability who have engaged legal argumentation of the, of the, uh, for their vulnerable sisters and brothers with disability who have not received a fair hearing regarding their care, this disability consciousness is best informed before considerations about medical interventions available to persons with disability are pronounced. <sighs> As a final word regarding the title of this presentation, <clears throat> philosopher and lawyer Max Ehrman wrote the poem Desiderata in 1927. It was published posthumously in 1948. Its popularity may have waned of late, but we human beings continue to burn with desires, with desiderata of many kinds, some mundane and others profound. Whatever the desires of people with disability, their family members, friends, those who care for and about them, and those who don't. I think we can take Ehrman's words to head and to heart in our striving for a better tomorrow. And I quote, go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even to the dull and ignorant. They too have their story. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. 
and you have a right to be here. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Somebody always has to ask the first question, right? Um, my name is Elizabeth Drummond. I'm in the history department here. And so I'm not an ethicist, much less a bioethicist. I'm also not going to ask a historical question. Um, I, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm asking a question as a professor. Uh, and in some of the, the discussions that you've had and where you've touched on, you mentioned the ADA. Uh, and I'm thinking about the tension between legalistic understandings of disability uh, and how we treat people with disabilities versus ethical understandings of that. So, at, and I, I say this with recognition that my dean is sitting just to the left of me. Um, the, uh, the instructions that we get as, as faculty is that the, we have an ADA statement and that, only, that we are only supposed to give accommodations to, to students who have registered disabilities with our Disability Student Services Office. Um, and again, I'm going to pretend that my dean's not sitting to the left of me. I ignore that. Um, and have a much more expansive understanding of how I'm going to give accommodations because of the, the race and class and all sorts of implications there. And so I'm just wondering if you can speak to that issue of the tension between the legalistic and the ethical and how we ought to navigate those sorts of um, issues from an ethical standpoint and a bioethical standpoint that has this sort of inclusive understanding of, of disability that you, you're speaking to today. Thank you very much. Um, it's a big question. Uh, at uh, my university, we also have the, the Division of Students with Disability Services. Um, and yes, we have to have a statement on our syllabi and faculty and accommodations need to be made if and only if the student has registered. Right. So, so that restricts the the largesse of the university, let's say, or limits the, the necessary accommodations that the university needs to make. We faculty don't, faculty members do not have to be as stingy. All right, I'm gonna go back to that word. I, this is my new word. Um, I like it lots. Um, uh, not that I wanna be stingy. I, I want to chastise the stingy among us, all right? Sometimes myself included there. Um, the accommodations that the ADA requires are the minimum. I would suggest that you not ignore those and continue to go above and beyond in meeting accommodations. Because the, the Office of Disability Services it is not going to say, you're not allowed to do that. You're giving that student too much. That's not going to get back. That's not going to get back to the, to, to the office because you're not doing anything illegal. You are doing what professors, I think, ought to be doing in recognizing the varying strengths and weaknesses that all of our students have. And we want to, we want to support all of our students in coming away from our classes with more knowledge, not less, with more interest, not uh, you know, a, a, a return from the class of that was another boring night. Um, we want them to be energized. What's the purpose of our being in front of them if we've lost our desire to, uh, to teach the subjects that we love? Shame on us as faculty members. Uh, so that we would go beyond what the letter of the law says is always acceptable. And to be encouraged, I would say. Well, it's good for pe <clears throat> Yes, when there is a mic, always use it. Always hey. use it. So thank you to the history professor for going first. Um, I'd like to take a step even further back. Uh, my name's Beth Hines, and uh, I'm the mother of a current student at LMU, and I'm the mother of a prospective student at LMU. And what I would like to get your thoughts are on what you think 
universities like LMU and like BC have to do to try to make these places more accessible to high school students who have disabilities and who perhaps could show uh, uh, capacity to succeed in this type of environment in ways that go beyond standardized tests, for example. So if I understand your question, you are uh, asking about students who desire, uh, high school students who want to apply to schools like LMU or BC or USF or wherever, uh, that there should be, there could be, there's nothing, there is nothing preventing any of the universities for developing testing materials that are accessible to students with a variety of disability. Right. So uh, I, I imagine Gallaudet University, this is the, the university uh, where, uh, where classes are taught in um, sign language, American Sign Language, and reinforced by um, chalkboard or whatever use. Uh, I suspect that the testing for entrance there is is particular to the community of deaf persons. Um, and those who wish to go to a school would need to demonstrate fluency in American Sign Language. Uh, so I, I think that it's, there's nothing that precludes a university of any sort from uh, developing testing materials for prospective students that accommodate their disabilities. Now, I don't know what's going on with the, the uh, you know, fill in the dot kind of test that I took to get into college many moons ago. Uh, and not much. They're still doing that. So, so universities would theoretically have the clout to put pressure on the Princeton and, and the whoever else makes the tests, the scholastic uh, conglomerate, conglomeration, uh, whoever makes those tests, universities could put pressure on them to develop more accessible testing uh, devices, testing instruments. But each of, these, each of the universities are, are dependent on those centers. And the universities are not aware because they have not, it, it hasn't dawned on them, right? This is what happens in, with, the, with, with the needs of students and adults with disability. It doesn't dawn on other people that I cannot hear you. I need to have someone signing your presentation to me so that I didn't see any, I, I, there was not an interpreter here so there was not anyone who is deaf in the room. Where was I going with that? Um, we need, we, we, the universities, need to put pressure on the scholastic testing services or develop alternate ways of uh, evaluating and, and judging. Well, because they're still going to get the student's transcript and their narrative and all those sorts of things. So uh, for the, the schools to get those, but they haven't, it hasn't dawned on that. That's where I was going with this. It hasn't dawned, it's not on the radar. Even though there are ADA requirements, and everybody knows there's the ADA. Most people haven't paid attention to it. Uh, because it doesn't concern them. However, it concerns 15% to 23%, 25% of the population of people in the United States. So the ADA is an important part. People with disability are important part, 25%, potentially 25% of the US population. That's a quarter. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lot of people. So it doesn't dawn on you. If it doesn't dawn on you, you don't do anything. It just seems to me that when I look around the campus here and I don't see the types of students uh, represented that my other son looks like, um, I think that it's a barrier removal issue. And when you ask colleges like LMU, um, 
what is the support, they say, well, after you get admitted, there's DSS. And I say, well, okay, but that's like saying, well, there's a wall here, and I expect you to jump over the wall instead of coming up with some, because it would take creativity yes. to come up with alternative ways to evaluate the capacity. Yes. And, if, and if you look at a lot of these colleges, quite frankly, international students, for example, they're not subject to the US testing requirements. Um, they can take them if they want, but they don't have to take them to be admitted. But a disabled student in the United States, regardless of their disability, has to produce those test scores to have their application even considered at a school like this, which a as, a, as an ethical matter, I think is problematic. And I would suggest it's the reason you don't see um, some of the disabled populations here. Um, m forget 23%, you know, you don't see them at all because they can't get over those hurdles. And, and it's a question of, does the school have an affirmative obligation as an ethical matter to remove the barriers? And should they be going out of their way to try to find the students that are interested in this type of environment and making it accessible before, right. you know, they- Certainly there's an ethical uh, impetus that, that could be engaged here and at, at my school as well as and most of the other elite schools in the United States. Uh, it, the, there are similar stories that have been told by students of color. You walk into some campuses and they're terribly white, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, and then they wonder why there's such a low diversity. Well, <laughs> what are you doing to, uh, to invite those students, right? So when the university communities, the academic community realizes that inviting students with disabilities is another uh, piece of the fabric that is the tapestry of humankind, then maybe we'll see, the, then maybe we'll see a difference. Thank you. Yes, please, yeah. and I see some people back here as well as up here. So I know people back here have had their hands up for a while, so maybe we can get the mic more next. Okay. All right. uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Don Powers, just a member of the community, uh, a Messianic Jewish believer on the Savior. Uh, so what I'd like to do, please, uh, with a broad brush stroke, uh, if I could, please, doctor, uh, what outcome could you foresee with monetary funding prov to provide equity? with theological clergy oversight, uh, with faith-based care providers for this societal uh, dilemma? Of care for persons with disability. Well, okay, monetary, uh, you're looking for? With, with, with the monetary funding to provide equity, with theological clergy oversight, to provide faith-based care providers for the society <laughs> dilemma as a whole. What kind of outcome could you foresee? Should that be able to be provided? Well, if we exist? could, I don't want to discourage faith-based organizations from funding care providers. So, you know, there are, there are many religious institutions that support and sponsor hospitals and other healthcare facilities in the United States and elsewhere. Um, what I have no objection to to broadening the support to provide services on a number of different levels for persons with disability. What I what I want more to happen is that our society. As, as a body politic, take the concerns and the experiences of people with disability to heart and begin to think about how, how we will make access readily available uh, and inclusive of all persons. So I want to see uh, a, a utopian, I have a utopian, right? I'm, I'm very idealistic in this. I think that it, you know, we, we could have a cap on people's salaries, for example. Right, so the, the persons that make $20 million a year, 
who needs $20 million a year when they probably have a you know, billion dollars already in their bank accounts? And so, so in this regard, I'm, I'm a more socialist when it comes to things. I follow a more European model, um, which has its problems, granted. Uh, nevertheless, there are caps. And the multimillionaires worldwide, many of them, many of those with, a, with a, what I could call a conscience, have stopped taking salaries, have stopped taking pay from their companies. Uh, the United States has an incredible economy and could distribute the wealth far more generously <laughs> than it does with our current taxation system. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Apgar. I'm a visiting professor in women's and gender studies. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, um, about your dependence framework. Actually, I have two questions. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to your choice to use the dependence framework, everyone is dependent, as opposed to like the fairly established interdependency framework commonly used in disability studies. Right, so <clears throat> I've been working on this notion of radical dependence for a long time. And it's inspired, it's probably inspired by my, my faith and belief in the Christian tradition, uh, where relationships are the necessary piece that holds the community as a community, that holds the church as the church. Uh, in theological language, the body of Christ is the church. The church is the body of Christ. Uh, the, the radical dependence piece is, in a way, in your face to get people to think a little bit more about the autonomous subject and whether or not that's just a modern fiction. Uh, it, it's always been a modern, it's always been a fiction that there is any self-made person. I want to shake that up by going with radical dependence. We are dependent on so many. And yes, it does it turn into the more easily swallowed interdependence. But if you you lose, if the chain breaks, you stop going. Uh, and that's, it, we depend on the chain links holding together. And we are deluding ourselves, I think, when we, when we don't admit the dependence we have our whole life long on so many webs. Yes, it's interdependent, but it is m more than interdependent. It is ultimate dependency on everyone for everything I have. I, I could not be here in so many ways without so many people. You know, uh, not just the not just my parents and my brothers and my extended family my teachers, uh, the, the, all the other kids in school whose parents paid some modicum of tuition uh, to keep the building heated and the lights on and the water run, rushing. Uh, we are so dependent on everyone that I want, I want to remind us of that insofar as dependence ha gets a bad rap and people who are dependent are thought to be less than or to be pitied. All of the negative adjectives that have been attached to people with disability because they depend on other people. Well, you know what? I depend on an awful lot of people too. Can I ask another question? 
I'm game if you're. Yeah, game. I think we have time for maybe two more questions, but we can carry on the conversation further. I think also. Uh, I can, oh yes, I, I'll pass it along. I don't want. I don't want to be hot. Thank you. I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna skip. Hi, um, I'm actually, my name is Harry. Um, I'm currently in freshman year and majoring in women's and gender studies currently. Uh, since you bring about the bioethical issues in association with gender, um, I think this time would be great to, task, great to ask about my inquiry. So firstly, I realized that I'm an intersex when I was five, but I'm legally documented as male. So every time when I try to get like medical treatments or med like any like medical, Trainments or any support from medical institutions, I have to check in a box where it shows either choose between male or female, or some institution have the box where I can check as both. But, but still, like into 21st century, like I'm like lots of people, like transgender people, intersex people are highly stigmatized and constantly getting eye discriminations from surrounded presence. So. I think this would be the cause because of the rooted gender binary perception and the patriarchy, I believe. But um, so since these people are getting a long-term surgical procedures to become a person who they really want to be, but still lots of like a marginalization and lack of medical cares are providing for them. So I realized that inter internalized patriarchy or institutionalized um, gender binary are prevalent in terms of macro and micro level. So I believe the, um, these representational changes are must to take an action to provide best treatment for them as, as soon as possible regarding theological perspectives of bioethics. So like, so, but I'm not sure whether these progressions are like currently you know, making in the status quo or there's any progression that you can see, like medical like supports to um, transgender people and intersex people and other minorities. This is a, a complicated and sensitive subject. And um, thank you for asking the question. I cannot answer where any of the professional communities are going or how quickly they're getting there. Uh, I do, I can say this in, in terms of uh, historical consciousness and, and the general community of professionals, right? Lump them all together, academics and medical folks and uh, social service folks, let's put all those in one basket, call them professionals. Um, I, I do know for, for certain from a historical consciousness perspective that while intersex, transgendered, uh, bisexual, lesbian, and gay persons uh, have lived as long across the millennia as people with disability, right, so there, the, there, we are just realizing or bringing to bear that history forward that, that folks who are different from the uh, hegemonic normativity of a male with power, as we come to recognize that hegemony is not the way the world goes, uh, we are all these professionals, the academics, we're, we're all grappling with uncovering what can be known about the various phenomena and then working with persons belonging to the minority communities, although clearly these are not minorities in the way we, we can think of them anymore, 15% of the population, right, as, as one example. Uh, as, as the professionals become increasingly more historically conscious of the realities that minority persons of a, a sexual 
diversity, a range of sexual diversities present. As more professionals become aware of that consciously, more professionals will then begin to investigate how to work with for the flourishing of persons who come to me with questions of care, whatever the care might be, education, social services, medical care. That's the best I can do right now. It's, it, this is a work in progress. The, the 21st century is a century that's going down in the books, right, as, <laughs> as one of um, great, great social change in recognition of persons who had never been allowed to be heard before. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, my name is Ryan. Um, so my question for you is, so uh, what uh, presidential programs have been created to, uh, you know, um, accommodate those with disability and which would, would you say would uh, be a good model for as we go forward? Wow, presidential as in U.S. presidents? As in U.S. presidents, yes. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, well, well, George Herbert Walker Bush signed the ADA. He pushed the, the Americans with Disability Act in. Um, I don't know how much the son W did um, in advance of people with disabilities. And, I, and it, it's not like he didn't have a lot on his plate. He, lived, he was president for uh, the attack on the World Trade Center and uh, the other crashes um, in DC and in Pennsylvania. So I, I can't say what he did. Um, uh, Obama gave us the um, Affordable Care Act. Um, and we know that the current resident in the White House is dismantling it as much as he, he can. Um, <clears throat> the Kennedy family, to go back, all right, so now I, from present to, let's go back to the 60s, the Kennedy family was proactive in getting uh, services for children with disabilities in particular. And they did that because, why? They had personal experience. One of, one of the, the daughters um, of the patriarch uh, was uh, a, a woman with disability, uh, developmental disability. And uh, they, they continued, the Kennedy family continues to support uh, many initiatives, Best Buddies, uh, being one of the initiatives that, that I think it's um, Bobby Kennedy's son, or no, Ethel's, Ethel's son, Ethel Schreiber's son, it's developed Best Buddies. Um, there have been, uh, so the concern and attention to persons with disability uh, started politically in, in the 60s. I would say, with the Kennedys, it really did start as a political concern in the 60s. Uh, unsurprisingly, at the same time as civil rights for African Americans and then subsequently extended to other ethnic minority communities in the United States, uh, particular uh, for African Americans in the United States civil rights. Um, disability, the disability rights movement started in Berkeley, um, California actually, uh, and I think there's the major headquarters now in Denver, Colorado. Um, but in terms of administrations, uh, the, George H.W. Bush signed the ADA. He made sure that that happened under his watch. Uh, so additional information, um, additional support, catch as one catch can. Uh, depends on who might be occupying that position. Thank you. So uh, again, uh, we will have a reception following here very shortly. So uh, if you didn't have the opportunity to ask your question now, there may be an opportunity to do so 
at that time. Um, so uh, to put a coda on the evening, uh, Dr. Delaro will give some final thoughts. Uh, just uh, to thank again uh, Nick for uh, uh, moderating the discussion and of course uh, um, Mary Jo, um, not only for the things you said, but I would say also for the ethical call to inclusive to challenge that with your thoughts. Um, her utopian vision for interdependence does include a reception, <laughs> and so to that reception, uh, you are all invited. Uh, please um, stay, uh, stick around for further conversation. Um, I also want to say thank before we conclude to all those who have made this um, event possible, in particular our program administrator at the Institute, Dr. Gigi McMillan, David Rogo, and of course our graduate assistants, Shanice McLeish, Kara Crew, and David Utech. And of course, thank you for all of you who have come. This was a uh, very uh, interesting uh, evening, and I'm sure we're leaving with uh, a lot of questions and perhaps uh, richer than when we. Thank you so much.